This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it seems that we've had wonderful weather in the last few lectures, so um, as opposed to this, the few snowy events that we've had in the past. So again, welcome um, for a wonderful afternoon. I am Ray Fouché. I'm an associate professor of history and also this year's resident fellow in the Center of Advanced Study. This year's theme has been titled Interpreting Technoscience, and we've brought in a series of lecturers that have helped us think about the ways in which science and technology influence and impact our daily lives and everyday existences. Um, so under that theme, I'm really excited to have Julian DeBell here to give a lecture today entitled Ludo Capitalism, Real Money from Play Economies and How I Made It. Um, so a bit brief introduction to um, Julian DeBell. I, I'm so used to introducing people as professor. So um, he is currently, I will call you Professor DeBell, um, but you are currently the George A. Miller, Miller visiting professor uh, here at the University of Illinois through the Center of Advanced Study and also a contributing editor to Wired Magazine. Um, he has written widely on a variety of topics um, and some, I would argue, some of the best writing on uh, science or technology in virtual worlds that I've read. Um, he has published three books. The first one is My Tiny Life, Crime and Passion in a Virtual World. Um, and another book that I believe part of the discussion will be about, the lecture today, is Play Money or How I Quit My Day Job and Made Millions Trading Virtual Loot. And most recently, he is the guest editor for the best writing in technology in 2009, um, coming out from Yale University Press. I believe it's, it's out now. Uh, I'm the 2010. 2000. 2010, down in September. So um, I'm sure we'll all look forward to it, and I'm great. Um, it'll be wonderful. Um, his writings have appeared in a variety of really amazing, popular and um, places, from Details, Spin, Harper's, New York Times, Rolling Stone, um, Village Voice, Time, and Wired Magazine. Um, and again, I think some of the best writing that I, I've um, read and seen about um, technology in the virtual world um, he has produced. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Julian DeBell for his lecture this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, am I, am I mic'd? Is this thing on, as they say? Yes? Um, good, again, thank you for uh, coming inside to this dark room on this beautiful, sunshiny day. I really appreciate it. Um, I was asked, uh, just a moment ago, um, if I was going to actually explain this concept of Ludo capitalism. Um, it's possible, um, but we have a lot to get through first. So, so let me get started. For the first thing I want to talk about is, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting used to this new remote control gadget, and perhaps. Um, is the notion of virtual worlds, which I'm going to uh, explain in some detail, just so partly so you can get your uh, get your bearings, understand a little better um, the kinds of uh, economies I'm talking about today, but also so that we can um, sort of begin to shore up conceptually uh, whatever larger point I may get around to making. Um, so when, when, when people talk about virtual worlds, often the, the, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, is this place called Second Life, um, which is which is a 3D uh, 
open-ended universe in which anybody can build anything, in which um, people have created real estate empires, made uh, millions of, of real dollars um, buying and selling uh, virtual items in these, in these places. Um, there are a number of uh, places like this. Um, There.com just actually went under this week. Uh, places for kids. Um, my daughter is a great fan of Webkins. Uh, there are Gaia Online for anime fans. Um, just um, a whole growing list of these places. Um, these are the, the closest matches to a lot of the science fictional virtual worlds people are familiar with. Uh, the Matrix, um, uh, William Gibson's Cyberspace, Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash. Sort of fully formed 3D worlds which are uh, mirrors in a way of the real world um, that surrounds and sustains them. Um, Habba Hotel, another interesting one. Um, there's another kind of virtual world uh, that's often talked about too, but not often. It, it's, it's particular distinctions from the other kinds of virtual worlds are not always um, uh, clarified, and I want to do that. The, the massively multiplayer online role-playing game um, called, believe it or not, More Peg for short, um, although if you're cool, you just drop the RPG and just call them MMOs. Um, these are the kinds of sword and sorcery, Tolkien-esque fantasy worlds uh, you may also be familiar with. EverQuest was, was one of the great ones. Uh, Age of Conan, City of Heroes, Lord of the Rings now uh, also has its own MMO. These are worlds in which um, you... They're also 3D graphical worlds, not always, sometimes they're text-based, um, but mostly they're, they're 3D graphical worlds in which you have a character, as in the other ones, uh, who goes forth into this world and, and, and interacts with it, and, and in which you deal with lots of other players at the same time. Um, the idea here, though, is they're more constrained. You have a particular path that your character is going to follow to um, achieve more and more uh, powers in this world. So uh, in EverQuest you might start out as a knight of some sort and you're level one and uh, you're killing rats and the more rats you kill the closer you get to level two so that you can kill the bigger rats um, so that you can level up more and ultimately you're slaying dragons and uh, you've acquired all kinds of treasures in this world. Uh, these are some of the the uh, examples of that, of course, the big one is um, the world famous World of Warcraft. Um, now has uh, 11 million players, about a billion dollars in revenues. Um, it sort of has sucked the air out of this entire space and now is the canonical example of the MMO. Um, and we'll be hearing more about it. So this is virtual worlds. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about what defines virtual worlds because that's often left hazy and to the extent that definitions are attempted, uh, um, they're kind of hazy too. Um, often you hear, well, what is it that distinguishes a virtual world? Well, it's a pers persistent universe. In other words, it doesn't, you know, it's not like you go on, play around, and it's over. Um, when you leave this world, um, it's still there. Things are still happening. And when you come back, things have progressed. Um, and, you, you know, your stuff is still there, and your character is still there. And so there's this, this ongoing reality. Um, they're networked, right? That means there's lots of people interacting in them virtually. Uh, they uh, 
rest on spatial kinds of representations. You go in and you're in a world that you move through. Um, they are avatar-centric. You inhabit a particular character that is your representation in this world. Um, and that's what you identify with. Um, and finally, and this is a big one that you hear, particularly around things like Second Life, is that they're not just games. You know, particularly the people influenced by the science fiction representations of them like to point out, well, this could be kind of the interface of the future. Um, you know, you don't log into your computer, you enter into a 3D universe and you inhabit it and you interact with your data there and all your other stuff there. And, and so Second Life is figured as not just um, a place for people to goof around. It's a place where people can shop and uh, uh, have business meetings and things like that. N None of these, to me, are, are really very satisfying ways of distinguishing what matters about virtual worlds from other kinds of online fora for interaction, right? I mean, persistence happens in Yahoo news groups. Um, you know, persistence happens on Facebook. Um, it's always there. Stuff happens while you're gone. That is not, to me, a very clarifying distinction. Neither, obviously, is the, is the fact that they're networked. Um, you know, all online spaces are networked. They are also largely whether we choose to use that metaphor or not, spatial. They have topographies. You're on a one Facebook page, you can go to another. Um, You're in one Yahoo group, there may be a link to another. There is a kind of uh, topography. We experience them that way. And neither is even the avatar centrism of these places particularly compelling uh, to me as a, as a definitional feature because um, the avatar, the physical body that represents you, or the name that represents you in a text-based virtual world, um, actually is not that different from the handle that you'll have in a Yahoo news chat room or, or the, the cursor itself when you're interacting with your desktop or with any other kinds of software. OK, so what? This last one, too, um, is unsatisfying because it seems to me that finally the only way you can really <laughs> single virtual worlds out from other kinds of networked communal experiences is that they are, in fact, essentially games. Now, that opens a whole can of worms, defining what play is and what games is games are as opposed to other forms of you know rule bound engagement or or kinds of interaction with the world it turns out to be a really tough problem but what's there are some interesting stabs have been have been made at defining games out there and one of them that i like is um, a, a, a term used by the anthropologist thomas malaby who calls games spaces of contrived contingency. They are places that try to recreate something of the feel of lived experience, the feel of things being at risk, at play, and undetermined in their outcome. Limited in their possible outcomes, because that helps us focus on the drama of the contingency, but not predetermined. So they're contingent, but it's a contrived contingency. And some of the elements of the contrived contingency of virtual worlds are, to me, salient. Um, one is their contrived geography. So I talked about how their spatiality doesn't necessarily distinguish them. Um, metaphorically speaking, from other kinds of online space. But the fact that they all insist on having a geography, representing it 
with as features that you have to struggle with to navigate around. That, to me, creates a game. That creates certain game-like elements. But more than that is the contrivance of scarcity. Right? The fact, the bizarre fact, that we now have these almost fully realized parallel universes that we can design any way we want to that could be paradise on Earth or the closest thing we could get to it in fantasy, right? What is the one thing, you know, that's wrong with the world ever since, you know, Adam and Eve were driven from paradise? We have to work for a living. You know, stuff doesn't just fall from the trees. And we have this chance to get back there and to escape this curse. And what happens? It turns out that the places people most want to hang out in are not these early 3D worlds like, uh, uh, oh, I forget what it was called. There, was, there, were, there were a lot of early 3D worlds where you could just go in and make anything and it was all groovy and you could have wings. And, and, and they were sort of fun, but basically chat rooms with furniture. And then along come these games where there's stuff that's hard to get, where you have to struggle to kill those rats so that you can get the better sword to kill the bigger rats. This endless treadmill of toil. Um, or in Second Life, where you have uh, much more freedom, many more degrees of freedom about how you can interact. But nonetheless, it's all based on the fact that land is scarce. Um, and that in order to get more land in Second Life, you need to get more Linden dollars um, by selling stuff. And, you know, we go into these potential paradises and we create, we recreate the great scourge of reality, which is scarcity. The fact that there isn't enough stuff to go around for everybody and you have to work hard to get at it. This, of course, as you know, anyone who's studied basic economics knows, um, means that there's going to be economies. So all of these places have virtual economies built in. Um, in World of Warcraft, when you kill a rat, uh, when you kill an orc, when you kill a monster of any kind, you get some little treasure and you get a little bit of gold. And this is how they print money in World of Warcraft. Um, this is how they manage the money supply. And you can take it and you can use it to trade with other players for the good stuff that they have gotten from their monsters, right? So not everybody gets the stuff they need. If they're a warrior class, they might need a big sword, and yet they killed a monster and a magic wand came off, and they don't need that. So they go to the marketplace and they trade with the wizards who may have the sword. Right? The virtual scarcity is part of the play element. The virtual scarcity leads inevitably to virtual economies. And so, by way of getting at the idea of ludocapitalism, I want to talk about some ways, as promised, that I've made money in virtual economies. Now, the first. Um, was my brief career as a virtual trader, a buyer and seller of virtual goods. Um, I blogged this um, in a blog called Play Money. It's still there if you want to go look it up. Diary of a Dubious Proposition. The dubious proposition was that um, starting in 2003, I was going to attempt to actually make something like a living uh, doing this under terms which, you know, I precisely detailed, and we'll see how that worked out. Um, to give you a sense of what I was doing, uh, this is the game Ultima Online, which is one of the few games in which it's actually not against the rules to sell virtual items for real money. So this seemed like a good place to go um, hang out my shingle as a virtual merchant, um, besides which I was already... Uh, abjectly addicted to the game, so there wasn't really much discussion about that anyway. Uh, this was me 
uh, the famed Al Hunud, uh, Grandmaster Smith, and as you can see, fearsome warrior of some sort or another. Um, uh, this is this is his castle, this sort of Moorish sandstone construction. Um, that's that's him riding that blue beetle. That was his epic mount at the time. Um, and these these are these little guys standing, you know, sort of at arms on on my porch are vendor kind of robot characters that I used to sell my stuff. I would buy stuff or find stuff or buy stuff in the game and use these little guys to sell. You could go up and click on them and they would present you with a sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, menu of, of goodies that you could buy. Um, now through the, the magic of PowerPoint pseudo animation, I'm gonna take you on a little tour of this, the capital city of, of uh, Luna. Uh, which was actually a big shopping district in, in Ultima Online. Um, here I am sort of... And again, by the way, and we'll go back and forth, back and forth, why not? Because we can. Um, and, and just to, sh I mean, this looks pretty crude, but in fact, I mean, when you played the game, it wasn't a lot less crude than this. And I, and, and I, and I show this partly to emphasize that it's not really about the, you know, the incredible realism of the 3D interface that these games are so immersive. I mean, these games have been immersive from the days when it was like you would log in and you would see a line of text slowly crawling across your screen that would say, you know, you are standing in the middle of a forest, um, there is a griffin nearby, and you would type slay griffin, and, you know, you would see how that worked out. Uh, it's it's about the complexity of these interactions in these, this, this contrived contingency and the richness of it. So, for instance, this big white castle also was a property of mine at one time. At this point, it no longer was. Um, I, had, uh, I had contrived to, to take possession of this plot um, in ways I'm not especially proud of, but. Um, it was a very valuable plot, and at a certain point, um, a guy who was a much bigger merchant in the game than I was um, came along and, and, and offered to buy it from me. Um, as you can see, he, you know, he subsequently turned it into a, basically a shopping mall. He's got way many more vendors than I do and a much better sense of presentation. But, um, so it was just as well that I sold it to him. But so, so what did I sell it? To him for so we we negotiated um, and determined through you know fair market negotiation that the value of this house was 20 million gold pieces and a southeast facing polar bear rug, <laughs> which is a rare item in the game. That uh, look every time I do this I get the, it's a laugh line right and it's, so I have to go like. The, and the laugh is like, who cares, right? 20 million imaginary gold pieces and an even more imaginary, you know, polar bear rug. And now I get to explain to you, you know, why you might care as well. Um, so at the time, you could go onto eBay and do a search on UO or Ultima Online and find all of these things for sale, not just in the game, but actually for real money, right? So. Here's Ultima Online, and you can see um, that the value of five million gold pieces here um, at the time was $100. And it turns out that wasn't a crazy, you know, that wasn't a crazy price. And that was basically the exchange rate at the time. Um, so it was one US dollar would buy 50,000 Britannian gold. Britannia was the strange name for this imaginary place that was not Britain. Um, but anyway, um, and you know, that's a pretty weak currency, I guess, but compared to, you know, at the time the Romanian Leo uh, wasn't doing much better. The Turkish Lira before revaluation was much, much worse. So, so this is a respectable exchange rate. and and. Gold being the most liquid item in the game was something you could pretty easily convert just by going onto eBay and, 
and making the sale one way or the other. So that 20 million gold he gave me for that plot of land was worth $400. The polar bear rug, well, I thought it was worth more, but that's how it goes sometimes. But it wasn't worth nothing. Um, you could go on and buy a polar bear rug at the time for about 25 bucks. Um, is that, in fact, the polar bear rug we're talking? Yes, click through, a little picture of the polar bear rug um, for sale. And you could buy it with you know, Visa or MasterCard. Um, and you would go in to the game, and you would make arrangements to meet, and, and the item would be handed over. That's how it worked. And this happened over and over and over again. There were thousands of these transactions going on all day. There are many more thousands going on today. So the value of that imaginary house was, yeah, 20 million gold pieces and a polar bear rug, but that's actually 425 bucks, which is not nothing. So that, you know, by the transitive properties of economics means that that house had a value of 425 bucks. This is a phenomenon known in uh, the MMO business as RMT. It stands for Real Money Trading. Um, I sometimes put quotation marks around the real because um, when you get right down to it and in conversation with um, you know, any econom economist, you will find that there is no meaningful distinction between a virtual currency and a real currency. They're just certain tokens of widely accepted exchange that happen to be more or less widely accepted depending on where you go. Um, now, you can do interesting things with this phenomenon. One thing is you can sell your little plot of land for 20 million gold pieces in a polar bear rug and turn that around and sell it for $425 and take your family to Disneyland for the weekend, which is what I did. Partly to impress upon my wife the importance of what I was doing in Ultima Online. Um, there are other things you can do conceptually that are pretty interesting, um, like this very interesting uh, paper that an, ec an economist named Edward Castronova wrote in 2001, in which he did a very detailed econometric analysis of the MMO EverQuest, which was at the time the leading game. And he did all kinds of calculations, you know, sort of how much, um, how much loot would a character gather in the course of a week. Uh, he did surveys. He took censuses. He analyzed all this stuff. And then he went to eBay and he worked out what the real prices were of all these things. So he was able not just to see what people were willing to pay, in fact, for some of these items and how much they sold for, but then to project using standard econometric techniques the value of all the other things that never traded on eBay but that were acquired in the course of a year in EverQuest by all the players. Real wealth was being created by players. It didn't matter that they thought of it as imaginary or not. It didn't matter that they chose to consume it rather than go to eBay and sell it for real money. From the economist's point of view, value is value is value. And once you can measure it in the market, you can put a number on that value. And this is what he did. He went and he measured all of the gold and magic swords and levels and potions and things like that that were acquired by this sort of tedious, arduous labor of the players in a given year and determined that it had a value of $135 million. Which, as GDPs go, is not a big deal, but if you break it down per capita, as of course he did, um, it's respectable, $2,260 per capita GDP um, puts it right under the little island nation of St. Vincent, um, just above Russia at the time, and way above China 
and India, with implications that we'll get to in a bit. Um, this was the tagline on the article that I ended up writing about this particular economy. Um, and that was the little joke um, that they added to it. Um, you can go on and you can, um, you can extrapolate. You can take these numbers and apply them to all of the MMOs and virtual worlds in which people create stuff and, and come up with other fun numbers. Um, 28 billion was the last time I took you know, the most reliable stuff and, and cranked the numbers was what all of these virtual economies were producing collectively the world over. And now we're getting into not just impressive per capita numbers, but absolute numbers. Um, this is pretty good. The absolute GDP of Lithuania is just slightly bigger. Um, the absolute GDP of Sri Lanka is just slightly lower. Lebanon, etc. Um, but again, besides these conceptual econometric tricks you can do with RMT, you can actually make some real money, as they say. Um, the actual market for virtual goods exchanged for real money um, as of a few years ago was toted up at around $2 billion, which curiously is, is around what all the companies you know, actually making these games are, are, are making in profits. Um, individuals can make a lot of money buying and selling this stuff. Um, I've known individuals who just, you know, doing this all by themselves, sort of running mom and pop shops going into Ultima Online, going into EverQuest, buying up stuff, going on eBay, selling it at a markup, which is what I ended up doing for my year, racking up six and seven figure incomes, buying their dream houses, um, you know, funding their kids' college educations, all that stuff. Myself, yes, the moment of truth. Um, my final tally, um, was there was a steep learning curve. Most of the time I didn't, I barely made a few hundred dollars, but by the end of the year I was really ramping up and if I had kept with it, I probably would have been able to make about $3,900, $4,000 a month in profit buying and selling this stuff. Um, at $47,000 a year, that's pretty respectable. Um, it wasn't quite more than I had ever made as a writer at the time. Um, in retrospect, I've sometimes thought I should have stuck with it. Um, but there you go. That's the bottom line. Um, what did I actually make? About $11,000 before annualization. The second way I made money in virtual economies was as a virtual laborer. This is something very different from being a virtual trader, from being a buyer and seller of things. Um, remember when I mentioned that the uh, GDP per capita of EverQuest was several times larger than the GDP of China? If you think about that a little bit, and people have, um, you realize that people in China the average worker is going to expect wages much less than the value of whatever they can produce in an hour, in a week, in a game like Evercast, in a game like World of Warcraft. Um, therefore, if you are an enterprising type of person, it might occur to you that you could set up a factory in China where people would play World of Warcraft day in, day out, being paid, oh, 25 cents an hour, 30 cents an hour, to harvest two or three dollars worth per hour of virtual stuff in World of Warcraft, in EVE Online, in, in games like this. The thoughts have been had. The enterprises have been undertaken. There are now several thousand of these 
factories, they're known as gold farms um, in China, employing hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and as a virtual trader, I had long been fascinated by this phenomenon. And, and um, so when I, when I got to see some examples, here's a, a snippet from a documentary about this one. I was very intrigued. <laughs> By the kind of bizarre notion of a factory of clay. Um, and the contrast between these, this, this, the surreal contrast between these you know, full color, 3D fantasy worlds and the, and the dreary kind of setting of, of the actual work or play. Of all, I was intrigued. Of all, I was intrigued by this. What this guy is saying here. You know, that, that there actually is some fun going on here. It seemed inconceivable to me. Um, and so I set out um, to see this stuff from my, you know, first hand. Um, and I went to the Donghua Wanglo Gaming Workshop in Jinhua, China, among others. Um, and besides talking to and, and visiting uh, with these, the gold farmers, as they're called, um, I undertook to, to work a shift myself. Um, and so here's me. Um, th this was a power leveling shop. And what they do in this place is it's a little bit of a step up from gold farming. Um, you can actually um, hire these factories to uh, take your character and level it up for you. So in other words, instead of you sitting there, you know, killing rats and, and orcs over and over again, you can pay them to do that and slowly level up to the highest levels in the game. And so this is what they were doing. And I was, you know, I was, because they knew I had some World of Warcraft experience, um, <coughs> um, addiction, uh, I was allowed to actually do a shift. Um, and so here's me. And you can see that it's, you know, not the easiest. You know, the, the chairs are not ergonomic. The, um, the, the, the uh, I don't know if we can, the, the mouse pads are really more like mouse rags. It was not really. Nice, and these guys are all, you can't see it right now, but they were all smoking every chance they got. Um, it, it is a 12 hour shift. You actually literally punch a clock. Um, these guys were working seven days a week. They had one day off a month. It was really hard work. Um, you got a lunch break, um, and you got a dinner break, and if you weren't careful, um, you know, because there's so much uh, cross-marketing in China between World of Warcraft and Coca-Cola, you might end up staring at World of Warcraft more even during your, your dinner break. Um, the pay, again, was not much. I got 30 yuan um, at the end of my shift. Um, very nice pay mistress lady. Um, that's like 30 cents an hour. Um, and I was glad to get it. Um, I, of course, was not living under the conditions these guys were. They live in the factory. They all, these are mostly single guys who have come from towns in the country or on the other side of China you know, to make their way. This is a very classic Chinese labor story. Um, and like a lot of factory workers, they live in the factory in very Spartan dormitory conditions. Um, they get, you know, between the end of their shift and, and when they need to go to bed and get ready for the next one, um, they have these sort of two or three hours 
uh, and you know, and they'll, and they'll choose to do different things. Some will um, play, you know, watch these great kind of martial arts soap operas that they have in China uh, in the break room. Um, others would just hang out in their in their dorms and talk. But but astonishingly, about half of the guys at the end of the shift went downstairs, not leaving the building still, went down to the first floor of the building where there was an internet cafe and continued to play World of Warcraft for fun. Which, I mean, there are ways to explain this, right? They were not playing someone else's character. They were playing their own characters. They were pursuing their own World of Warcraft destinies. But nonetheless, they were still playing World of Warcraft, what they were doing 84 hours a week, almost every other waking hour of their lives. So obviously, my assumption that this, you know, was a space in which play could not have existed, you know, in which this blurring of the boundary between play and work that I had already experienced as a virtual trader was finally just wiped out, you know, and every last vestige of play squeezed out of this experience was not in fact the case. Somehow these guys maintained a playful sense of engagement with World of Warcraft. And when I went back the next day, I noticed that in fact they brought this back to their working day. Even as they were working, they were sort of looking over each other's shoulders, cheering them on as they were killing a monster or laughing as they were dying, trading trips, tips with each other about you know, the best ways to do this. You know, I interviewed a lot of these guys too, you know, um, and, and some of them actually thought this was a cool job and you know, were sad to think they'd have to move on because it wasn't something you could do for the rest of your life. Others said, oh, this is a crappy job. You know, it's a little better than the, the Nike factory that I was working in before, or, or a little bit worse, and I, you know, I need to find a better job. Um, it sucks. Even these guys, I would ask, well, look, as you're playing, you know, as, you're, as you're fighting that monster, and you know, both of your life bars are down to almost zero, and it's not clear who's going to win or who's not, this contrived contingency, is coming to a boil, do you not still feel some kind of rush of adrenaline, some engagement, some fascination with the outcome? And they looked at me like I was stupid. They said, of course, nobody wants to die. Um, so I went to China expecting the gold farm to be some kind of limit case, and it was. But what I expected to see was the final, you know, wringing out of play from this confusion of play and work. I expected to see that it was possible to really turn a game into nothing but work. And I found that in this case it was not. That there is something very sort of inextricable about the relationship between these two poles of activity, at least in this context. So what did I make from that? $3.78, that's the bottom line there. My next uh, venture, making money in the online world, I was a virtual author. As Ray was kind enough to mention, I did actually write a book about this experience um, based on the blog, essentially. Um, it is, um, I mentioned this for purely uh, intellectual reasons, um, actually, um, yeah, I just checked, it's, 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 it's marked down, the, the, the Kindle is still $9.99. Um, this, this was the, the book that I wrote about my experiences um, buying and selling in Ultima Online. Um, when it came out, the, the publisher said, well, can you think of any you know, interesting kind of publicity events we could do that would, would tie into um, you know, the, the, the subject of the book? And I said, well, we could launch it in Second Life. Um, and they thought, oh, this is fabulous. And indeed it was. I, I knew a guy who was a great um, Second Life bookmaker. Um, 
And he would make these, this is me being interviewed by uh, sort of the leading talk show host of Second Life. Um, and you know, the great thing is in Second Life, you have a little book and you go in with the modeling things and you can blow it up to a gigantic book and throw it around as a prop on the stage. Um, these were books that you could actually hold in your little avatar's hand. Um, and I don't, I, I should do another screenshot. If you, turn, if you turn the camera around and look over my avatar's shoulder there, you will actually see the text of the book and you can flip the pages. Um, and I sold this for 750 Linden dollars, which um, comes out to about two bucks each. And this was, this, was, this was really fun because the publisher was all, oh great, this is a kicky idea. And I was like, well, no wait, here's the other part it actually is a revenue producing project I'm talking here about here. We're gonna actually make Linden dollars. And it was like, oh, <laughs> Julian, Linden dollars. Keep the Linden dollars. I was like, really, you're sure about that? I was like, they're like, yeah, because normally I would keep nothing, right? I'm still earning out my advance. They would get it all and I might get you know, a, a, a little bit of it. This was money going straight into my pocket. So I was like, okay, yeah, it's, it's funny money. Um, Because, you know, I no longer had the rights to my book. I no longer had the publishing rights, which we'll, 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 we'll get into. Um, but one of the things I want to emphasize here is, is that people actually, actually bought this thing, which kind of makes no sense, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a book that you would not want to read in Second Life. I mean, it's excruciating, the mousing and the kind of looking over the shoulder. Um, you would not buy this book to read it. It would not, it does not prove sort of um, the second life hypothesis that this is the future of commerce. On the contrary, it says something weird about why people are buying a little Guga like this. And to me, again, it's the contrived nature of it. It's that it's this cute little, cute little object that, you know, it's fun to think about how it's not really real. It relates to the real rich contingency of life, of markets and commerce, but it's not. Bottom line there, I made about 80,000 Linden dollars. I don't know what the exchange rate is um, currently, but it was, a, it was around 300, 400 bucks. Clear, straight into my pocket, uh, nothing to do with the publisher. Um, For my final money-making project, um, I did a little something based on that project. Uh, I actually, I was a virtual artist. Now, this happened when I was invited um, to an arts festival in Belgium to give a talk. And uh, they seemed to have this crazy notion that everyone is an artist, and they invited me to bring some art of my own creation that they were gonna sell in a vending machine. Um, it was some, crazy conceptual thing about the relationship between art and commerce, and, and I guess they thought this all had something to do with it. And I said, look, you know, I, you got the wrong guy, I'm not an artist. They said, come on, we'll give you, we'll actually pay you extra if you bring some, some art. And so I said, hmm, well, I like to do bookmaking. Um, you know, I had actually written books, but what I really like to do is make handmade books for my daughter and things like that. And I said, well, I'll make some handmade copies of Play Money, and you can sell them in your vending machine. The more I thought about it, the more fascinated I got with the idea of taking a book about virtual commodities that I had already turned into itself a virtual commodity by selling as a virtual book in Second Life, I thought, how can I twist this knot of, you know, the screw of, of layers of immateriality one turn further? You know, I'm already, now I'm making a handcrafted version of this thing that has already been a virtual object. I'm, I'm, I'm enhancing its materiality, um, you know, foregrounding it in a very obvious, uh, suggestive way. What more can we do with this? So, I played around with that thought, so I, I happened to have the PDFs. This is another mistake the publisher did. Never give your author the PDFs to their own book. Who knows what they'll do? 
Um, obviously, I did not have the rights to be doing this, right? Now, before I had gone and asked them, can I do this, right? Because when you make a contract with a book, with a book publishing company, you sell the publishing rights. You, the author, it's a strange relationship. You've created this thing, but you no longer have the right to distribute it. So I had to ask their permission to sell it in Second Life, and they were like, fine, it's, it's funny money. This, I said, eh, I'm not going to ask them, because it was a little much, too much like a real thing. Um, so this is a little like under the radar. So I actually sat there and hand-folded all these pages. This is me in the hotel room in Belgium, realizing that it takes a lot longer to make three hand-bound books than I thought, and staying up all night before uh, the talk. Um, you know, hand gluing the bindings, uh, making the cover myself, sewing, gluing on the book cloth, uh, putting in the handsome end papers, um, stamping the cover with a handmade stamp, um, really going overboard here, sewing an actual dollar bill into the cover just to make it as, you know, arty and craftsy as I possibly could, um, and yet still playing with the notion of what's virtual and what's real. I mean, because a paper dollar, what is it? It's a piece of paper, it has some reality, but it's reality as money has nothing to do with the paper. Voila. Um, and yet, this did not seem enough. It did not seem to be enough play with the tension between the material and the virtual here. And so I took it one step further here um, and added an end user license agreement to my book. <laughs> Um, because having made it entirely material, now I was going to take it back into the realm of the virtual altogether. Um, so this is the end user license agreement. And the great thing is, you know, I thought this was this wacky notion, but when I went online to get examples, there's all kinds of crazy end user license agreements um, that you may be familiar with from, from uh, you know, uh, installing Microsoft products and so forth. And so, you know, it was almost already made. I mean, things like uh, by using the book in any way, uh, you indicate your acceptance of this agreement. I mean, that's basically what happens every time you click through on one of these online or software agreements is, is they, you know, they've got you. Just the a very act of using this stuff binds you to this agreement, and then you're bound to all kinds of craziness. Um, and, and things like this, oh, but since to give the illusion of choice, if you do not agree to these terms, you know, write to Microsoft and get your money back. So I added some of that too. A um, little description of the book, just you know, to clarify what we're talking about. Um, and then the meat of the thing. This book is actually not a book. It is a token for a virtual book. If you deliver this to me, um, I will give you a virtual book in Second Life. Um, but that's not the purpose of this. And, and by the way, Clause 3, the book does not belong. That's standard boilerplate, even on, you know, on any piece of software. Um, but the PS is resistance. So you can't read the book, because then it would be a book, wouldn't it? I mean, that's so. Um, and, and, and then it would actually be that I was not using this as my own personal copy for authentication purposes. This struck them as art, and Dooley went into the vending machine. Um, and uh, what did I make from that? Um, 400 euros they paid for me. And I'm, I'm still toying with the idea of putting up an extra copy on eBay, so I may make a little money more off of this. This had a very small nexus with the virtual economies I'm talking about, which is that ultimately, this book really actually represented a virtual book in Second Life. But it leads out into, into the larger questions here I'm talking about by, by pointing out the ways in which so much of our economy now is governed by the form of contrived scarcity that is intellectual property, right? There's no natural reason now that copying is so easy that we shouldn't be naturally copying all of these things that are considered property endlessly. Um, but we contrive a certain scarcity um, that parallels this scarcity that produces the virtual economy. Why, when we can now have this 
paradise of goods do we choose, are we attracted to contrived scarcity? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm fudging some of the political issues around intellectual property here to, 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 to draw a parallel, but, but they're related, and they're related to the larger point that the logic of games is diffusing more and more widely into the workings of the global economy, that the global economy more and more is drawing on the logic of games and being informed by them. So this is where we get to the issue of what I call ludo-capitalism. Um, and given that we're cruising towards being short of time, I'll, I'll, I'll so here's the nutshell version. Uh, play is going to be to the 21st century what steam was to the 19th century. That's not, those of you who are dying to go out into the sun, go. That's it. That's the nutshell. Um, what does this mean in practice? Well, the outlines are just starting to be clear. I mean, I came face to face with this, you know, the confusion of play and work in the virtual economy. But, but, but these, these are very kind of localized examples. The idea that play could be a driving force in the economy at large is just beginning to be uh, worked out. So there have been speculative notions. Uh, Nicholas Yee, a student of, of MMOs, a, a psychologist, scholar, came up with this you know, scenario in which you could actually take some of these incredibly tedious grinds that people do in these games. Grind is the technical term in MMOs for things you do over and over and over to, to get ahead. Um, and some of these like crafting grinds, like if you want to be a leather worker in World of Warcraft, you have to make certain things over and over and over again. Um, wouldn't it be more interesting to be, say, in a science fictional universe, a person who like has to read little random patterns over and over again, right? And click on, you know, where's the little cluster in this picture? Um, and after a while, wouldn't it be interesting if the computer server itself could begin to estimate how good you were at picking out these little globules and start to drop in real x-rays that have been, you know, sent to them by doctors who want them analyzed. And then you just, you know, without realizing it, you're clicking on uh, x-rays, digital x-rays, that normally would have been sent to India <laughs> to be clicked on by, you know, uh, underpaid or low-paid workers there. Um, and now, not only are you being paid less than the Indian workers, which is a common practice now, you would be paying not only less than the Indian workers to do this work, you would see it as play, and you might actually pay for the privilege of doing these people's work for them. That is the sort of fantasy. There, there's other versions of it. There's a science fiction novel called Ender's Game in which uh, a young boy is brought up on this space station playing a game um, that gets harder and harder and harder. Um, at the end of it, um, those who don't want the story spoiled, please walk out. Um, it's, it's discovered that he has been actually fighting an intergalactic space war by remote control because only a child engaged in play could do this because it was too much of a freak out for all the grown-ups um, to think that they were fighting for the existence of humanity. Um, this is a fantasy. Um, it turns out the military is very interested in this particular fantasy, the, the, the overlap between um, games as play and games as training. Here's a game called Full Spectrum Warrior that was developed um, in partnership between the Army and a game company. Um, the Army wanted an actual officer training module, and that's what they got. The game company got an awesome first-person shooter that they actually sold. Um, 
the line between training device, between motivational device and play device is starting to blur here. And in the minds of, of some in the defense establishment, I'm told by some colleagues who have gone you know, to do consulting for the defense department and some of these kind of more futuristic realms, some of the young you know, agency workers show up with copies of Ender's Game, like a Bible, you know, like this is, what we, this is where we want to take warfare in the future. Um, it, which, you know, part of the punchline of, of the book is that Ender is crushed to discover that this is what he's been doing with his childhood and that he's actually exterminated an alien race without knowing it. He spends the rest of the trilogy, like, wandering around the universe, ex, ex, you know, expiating his sins. Um, these guys weren't so interested in the, in the other books of the trilogy. Um, okay, but these are speculative things. What is remarkable to me is that over the years, I'm starting to see more and more uh, attempts to implement this logic um, in a more direct way. So you have things like now, um, kind of uh, have your kids do their chores as an MMO type of sites, where you know you go questing. You know, I, don't, I, I can't. I haven't been able to bring myself to to play these games, but you know, you, you sort of go. You do the you know cleaning the toilet quest, and you get you know so many points and so forth. Um, uh, uh, um, a much more sort of verging on the logic of, of, of capitalism itself example of this is, is the Google image labeler. Has anyone played this game? Right? It, it, okay. Did, did anyone else find it as actually addicting as me? It, yeah, it, it's a sick thing, and I'll tell you why. It's a fun game, all right? So you are shown an image random image drawn from Google's database of imagery. And you are paired with someone that you can't talk with except that you're both throwing up labels that might quickly identify this picture. And if any of your labels match, you both get a point. Now what is going on here? Well, it's a fun game for the player, but it's a great form of crowdsourcing for Google, which has all these images that need you know, simple uh, verbal identifiers. And computers, artificial intelligence, is not at the stage where it can just look at that picture and say, you know, David Hasselhoff, um, you know, chest hair, um, all the things you would want to say about that picture and make it easily searchable. So people have to do that, but people are expensive, but not if they're playing. They don't cost anything. If you, Get them to play a game and do this as a game. This is as old as you know, Mark Twain convincing his friends to, to, to whitewash his aunt's fence and, and that it's going to be fun and they're going to actually pay him to do it. But that was just a thought experiment. This is now starting to happen, right? So the sick thing about this game is you would think it would be, you know, once you knew what it was about, it would ruin the fun. But in fact, it doesn't. And you sort of sit there in this double consciousness of like being addicted and at the same time, like giving your play energy over to the bottom line of this gigantic corporation. Other examples, um, a lot of these crowdsourced um, uh, mapping projects now, like the Mars mapping project or the genome folding or the, the uh, protein folding thing or the search for extraterrestrials. Letting people take part as a kind of playful exercise in a, in a gigantic collective exercise. Uh, Mechanical Turk is an interesting case. of uh, uh, This is a thing set up by Amazon to allow people to do very simple artificial intelligence-like tasks, like the Google image labeling, but for very small amounts of money per task. So you might you know, be called on to say which numbers in a row of numbers is the, are zip codes and which ones aren't. Um, and you might get, you know, a penny for every number you pick out. Very small amounts that, you know, for people in Bangalore maybe could start to add up to a living. But for the many, many people in the Western world who are doing this, yeah, they'll say it's about the money, but obviously the money is really 
at those levels a kind of scorekeeping. It's a game. Um, and so here's like the list where you go and log on and you can you know, pick, your, pick your tasks. Um, how many of you recognize this lovely? Uh, anyways, this is some of my own uh, farm bill art. Um, I built the Mario Nintendo one-up figure there out of roses and cotton. Uh, but that's not the point. The point is, Farmville is a very addictive leveling type game um, in which um, it's free to play. And this is, this is a brilliant example of how the game companies are starting to master the mechanics of these virtual economies um, in ways uh, that it can start to generate revenue. So it's free to play, but at a certain point you want more uh, fuel for your tractor uh, because you want to grow your crops faster, you want more seeds. And so you're offered the option of either A, paying money to buy the tractor fuel for your thing, um, or B, doing like these crazy, like if you sign up for Netflix for a week, you'll get the tractor fuel, um, it, you know, no, not necessarily any cost. Just to give you a sense of how these things you know, the richness of this economy compared to the days when Mark, you know, when Tom Sawyer was just starting to dream up the possibilities. Um, at one point when they were trying to work out the, this, the revenue model for this, somebody proposed, a company that, that works with Mechanical Turk very closely, um, that a third option could appear to people who desperately wanted fuel for their farm bill tractors, was they could be sent to Mechanical Turk to do some Mechanical Turk hits. So game economy fueling game economy fueling real economy at some point in this strange cycle. But no longer remotely in Kansas in terms of the, you know, the, the economics of this. This is spreading. Another example of this is a, is a site called Top Coder which is a place where you can go um, as a company and have custom-made software um, for you know, your, your company. Um, and that's what it is on the front end. It's, like a, it's a custom software selling shop. On the back end, it's a game. It's a contest for thousands of coders who want to prove their chops and compete to be the best coder. There's some prizes in there, but basically they're doing it. There's some cash prizes. But basically, they're doing it for bragging rights. And so this company is running basically a game on the back end, and they're using that ludic energy, the play energy, to drive a business on the front end. Those of you familiar with the open source software movement generally, I'll, I'll leave it to you to draw your own conclusions, but a lot has been said about what motivates open source software, which is you know, creation of huge amounts of value. Um, Linux, Apache, for motivations that are mysterious to the average businessman. They don't understand why are all these coders creating this value for no compensation. Very complicated thing to answer, but right at the center of it is it's fun. It's a kind of play. And it's a huge part of the information technology industry. And the, you know, I can talk about the ways this could spread into manufacturing and all kinds of other realms of production, but the point is the logic is out there. It's an obvious winner for any capitalist who sees that, well, we can go to China where they ask for 30 cents an hour, or we can go to the players who ask for nothing. And they're gonna go to the players. So it's a, it's a logic that's going to, to the extent that it's viable, is gonna drive out other kinds of compensation. It's something that we need to start thinking about. I have a whole riff on you know, how you could ground this in theory. 
um, social theory. Um, but I was more interested in it when I wasn't sure this was ever going to come to pass. Now that I'm starting to see it come to pass, eh, I'll, I'll run through the theory very quickly. Basically, you take a little bit of Marx, a little bit of Weber, uh, some Heisinger, a guy who wrote Homo Ludens, uh, Alan Turing, the guy who uh, described the logic of the computer and digital possibilities in the early 30s. Add them all together, you got your theory. Uh, contemporary capitalism, sure, it's a theory of contemporary capitalism, sometimes called millennial capitalism, sometimes even called casino capitalism. I'm suggesting that we've arrived at a point where capitalism itself, its evolving logics, is revealing it to be, if not having always, always already been a kind of ludo capitalism, finally attaining a state in which it is indistinguishable from what I'm calling Ludo capitalism. And if you're really interested, we can tease that out in the question and answer, but since we're already impinging on the question and answer period, I'll, I'll, I'll set the mic circulating and, and let the question start. Or we can all go out into the sun and sit on the grass and drink beer. Let me ask a question for you. The microphone is. That was really great. Hey, Julian. Um, uh, I, since you ended on the millennial capitalism and casino capitalism um, bit, I wanted to s ask whether or not um, you know the, uh, the the folks who write around casino capitalism, millennial capitalism, will oftentimes write around the emergence of this new form of um, of uh, of capitalism in the 21st century um, as being contextualized against um, a state of risk and economy of of risk and devolution of um, other forms of security that once upon a time may have been provided by bounded nation states, the welfare state. And so it's in this context that new forms of um, capitalism in the free market become almost these um, spaces of um, vital uh, recreation, let's say, right? And so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you see, um, and, and then the, the, this notion of um, a play economy in some ways get, can get framed as a kind of fantasy of possibility. Um, and so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, uh, the way you see or the way you have heard people as well talk around risk and, um, and insecurity. Um, well, kind of, or whether or not you see it as a factor at all. I, I, I think it's, I mean, I, I, obviously it's related via the, you know, the notion of casino capitalism, Susan Strange's notion that, you know, the economy, there's lots going on in the economy, all the way from subsistence economy, you know, up into the, you know, worlds of high finance. And then, you know, but it's not turtles all the way down at, or all the way up. At, you know, at a certain point we reach this realm of, of um, uh, you know, d derivative trading that is all about precisely managing risk, you know, and, and one level, hedging bets and stuff. But, but by creating, you know, these virtual tokens of, of what at the bottom of the chain are supposed to be, you know, real objects. But as we know, by the time we reach, you know, the level of third and fourth order derivatives are, are no such thing. Um, and so, you know, that to me seems uh, the obvious connection, right? That, that this then becomes literally a kind of game, a kind of casino, that there is no, uh, nothing but play at the level of, this, of speculators. Um, and, and they themselves, you know, again, it's, it's money as a scorekeeper, you know. They're, yes, they'll, you know, their bonus will go up, um, but, the, but the, the, the amounts that they're playing with are nothing they will ever, you know, a, they will ever hold in their hands. Um, they're, they're keeping score. 
I feel like I wish I, I you know, I, I, I'm trying to dive deeper into the question because that to me seems obvious, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's precisely the point that Susan Strange makes. Um, I think there is something related to that about in, in, in capitalism itself, which is the, to go back to the, the Marx screen, right, which is where I quote um, uh, the line from the Communist Manifesto, where he talks about all that is solid melts into air, you know, endlessly requoted. But what is it really about? It's, it's about the dynamic built into capitalism from the beginning that it's always about transcending the existing means of production, you know, that it's always looking towards the next possibility um, because it's always looking for growth, you know, it's always, so it lives in a virtual realm from the beginning, in a, in a realm of make-believe, you know, that is of a piece with this virtuality and, and these realms of make-believe that I'm talking about. So that's, that's sort of the deeper place that play, I think, comes into uh, capitalism. Yes, it's, it's flowering in these crazy ways now um, with the world of high finance, but I, I think it's always been there as kind of a seed in the way the whole thing works, if that begins to answer your question. Christian? Right. I mean, with the important point that, that, you know, I go to China and it looks weird to me that play and work are, are blurred. I go, you know, I, I immerse myself in this world and it feels strange that they're, that they're blurred. But, but what's weird is that we've tried for so long to keep them separate. I mean, that's, I mean, if one's going to talk about, you know, the natural state of humanity, the notion we have that play and work are these very separate things is, is, is less close to that natural state. It is, as you say, a historical imposition, um, an artifact of capitalism. I mean, that's sort of the funny thing, that where, whereas capitalism has play kind of built into its own logic that ultimately it's going to come around and, you know, and devolve entirely into something like play, it, it begins with precisely this separation that is artificial. And so, you know, what's going on is not so much that, you know, we're getting chocolate in our peanut butter and peanut butter in our chocolate, but the, the false distinction between peanut, never mind the analogy, the, the false distinction between play and work is, is being eroded by all these forms. I mean, which is to say, yeah, I have nothing to add to your question. Except I did.
Uh-oh, okay. <laughs> Right. Like I said, it's, you know, once you go into the definitions of play and games, you're on really soft, squishy territory. I tend to think it's more interesting to look at the ways in which something like play or, or, or the framework at play is used tactically for one purpose or another. You know, either to try to claim, reclaim from the capitalist workspace a space of autonomy. You know, to say, no, I want to control what I do and when I do it. Um, or conversely, to say, hey, do this work for us. It's play, you know. And at that point, it's really impossible to say. Right, I think it is really impossible to say generally this is play or this is labor. You know, what's going on at the Google image labeler, you know, when someone's playing that? I don't think you can say. But from different perspectives, it either is play or, or it is work. And so we still, we, we retain those terms in order to talk about the tension and the dialectic and the mess. You know, it's so messy that you can't just get rid of the mess. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's a very complicated pair of terms that is indispensable, partly because the way play works, it's magic, it's motivating magic, is, is to say, I'm not work. You know, you're doing this because it's that other thing that you do for yourself. Yeah, no. <laughs> I think we do. I think we all need to. Well, I mean, you've outlined some of them, right? I mean, people at a certain point start to get a little freaked out um, because, you know, certain boundaries that have been important for a long time are being messed with, and maybe there are new boundaries that need to be established. So the Farmville scam scandal that, that Brian's talking about is, is, you know, at a certain point, um, people started looking more closely at these offers that were being given as an alternative to paying money for your tractor fuel or your seeds in Farmville, right? You could either pay money or you could go take one of these trial offers. And some of them were, yeah, sign up for Netflix for a week. That's a very transparent you know, deal that you strike with Netflix. Others are, you know, were more along the lines of, here, click on this site um, and get almost to the end of this questionnaire, and then we're gonna send you to another site, and then we're gonna send you to another site, and after that site, um, we're gonna ask you a simple yes or no question. Now, don't read it, just answer yes or no, and before you know it, you've signed up for like a cell phone for three years, right, that you've paid for in advance. Um, so there were, there were sleazy things going on, but the very, notion, you know, that, say, children who don't have money are being offered the chance to do these things is also, you know, there are limits 
just on the level of you know the squick factor, you know how much people are willing to do. But honestly, when you look at virtual economies themselves, I mean, I look at virtual economies because they show, on the other hand, that the limits may not be what you think. You know, how could you know a twenty-eight billion dollar economy be sustained? by a market in you know, lizard men skins, right? I mean, at bottom, right? This stuff is all imaginary and it shouldn't sustain a huge economy. But just as with you know, the derivative markets, which themselves are you know, gazillions times larger than any real commodity that actually underpins them, once you set Virtual value free. I mean, it's 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 hard to you know it's hard to limit the size of the economy. The kinds of ways in which these dynamics may be exploited may have their limits, but you know the extent to which these kind of production spaces might come to dwarf others is not easy to easy to define. Thank you. Thank you.